Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today we are turning our attention to indoor plants. As it is January right now, I am in the season of pulling down the Christmas greenery, the Christmas tree, and we're left with a house that is bare and can look kind of boring and also just in need of some signs of life. So that is why I think right now is the perfect time to talk about houseplants, houseplant care, selecting houseplants. I am having on Maria. She's from the podcast Growing Joy where she shares everything there is to possibly know about houseplants. I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. I know that I afterwards was super inspired to want to get so many more plants in my house. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Well, thank you so much, Maria, for joining me. I'm looking forward to talking about plants as it is winter and dreary out here. It gives us a little bright spot to think about growing stuff and something green. So let's start by, you can introduce yourself, your podcast, whatever else you want to mention. Yeah, I'm Maria. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. I feel like I've seen your um, podcast logo on the charts. You know, we always hang around the charts together for (laughs) lifestyle. So it's fun to finally put a face to the name and the podcast art. But yeah, I'm Maria. I'm the host of the Growing Joy podcast, and I help people care for plants successfully and cultivate joy in their lives through doing so. So I used to be an epic plant killer. You couldn't pay me to keep a plant alive. And um, (laughs) I went through this really amazing transformation when I moved in with my husband. He was my boyfriend at the time. I wanted to nest. I decided to give plants one more try, this time actually Googling them and trying to set them up for success for me to not just kill them. And uh, the crazy thing is when I learned to care for plants, they actually, I'm like a self-help junkie. I'm a, I am love a good self-development book. I love a good you know wellness podcast. And plants ended up being the most affordable, accessible tool for self-development and wellness for me. They really helped me disconnect from screen screens, reconnect to myself and reconnect to nature because I was living in 500 square feet in New York City. So, you know, I was real disconnected to nature and farm style living and, you know, slow living and and house plants were kind of my gateway drug to reacquainting myself with nature and the power that nature can have for for healing and and happiness. So, that's what I'm doing in my corner of the internet. So, slow living but definitely through through the lens of plants, house plants and gardening. Yeah. Yeah. And are you still in the city? I am not. So I was part of the, I call it the mass millennial exodus in the pandemic. (laughs) So another thing is I started my podcast. It used to be called Bloom and Grow Radio. Now it's called Growing Joy because my book's name is Growing Joy. So we just kind of simplified everything. But I was a professional musical theater performer for the last 10 years. And Bloom and Grow Radio or, or my podcast Growing Joy was my just like side project. It was just like a little passion project of mine. And in the pandemic, I lost my job as a performer, and that's when I kind of had the opportunity to take my podcast and plant. I became a professional plant lady. Okay, wow. So in through that, in the pandemic, I no longer had to be in New York City for my real job, which was Broadway. So I ran for the hills, and now I live in the middle of nowhere in the Catskills in the mountains on five acres you know, we see more wild turkeys than we see humans every day. And (laughs) I like to say I went from 500 square feet to five acres and it was a really radical transformation, but I'm not looking back. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. That's awesome. I know that on your, whenever I was looking at your uh, PDF that you'd sent me about your podcast, you talked a little bit about talking about business and we didn't really, I didn't really put that on the outline, but is it your podcast and then the book sales that you decided to take full time during the pandemic? Yeah, so uh primarily podcast, yeah. My my main my main conduit to my audience is my podcast for sure and podcast advertising. I have a paid garden society, so I have a an online app basically for my listeners. So you can join, you know, if you want to meet other houseplant enthusiasts and get some training and connect with other people that want to nerd out <laughs> about plants as much as you do, you're welcome to our our troll free corner of the internet. I call it the kindest and plantiest corner of the internet. <laughs> and then yeah, the book came the book came out of nowhere. I had just lost my job as a performer. I was kind of, you know, asking the universe what was next. And like out of nowhere, one of my listeners 
is an editor at like a fancy publishing house and was like, hey, you want to write a book about plants and wellness? And I was like, do I want to write a book about plants and wellness? I think I do. So that's been kind of the last two years navigating writing a book for the first time was a pretty wild, wild experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So let's dive straight into houseplants. We'll start there and then we can go into some other like garden type plants as well. House plants is where we're at right now since it's January and we're all stuck inside. Yeah. Now, January is when I really start to think about house plants because I have so much greenery going with like Christmas decor in December and then most of January. And then I take all of that down. January, February, the only green thing I have in the house is going to be my house plants, which are kind of just hiding right now as I have out all my Christmas stuff. So, okay, we're going to do house plant care. 101. Okay. The first bullet point on this is how to stop killing your house plants. I guess in this, maybe we'll talk about like the top mistakes people make when they sure. kill things. Yeah. So first off, whatever you've done, sweet listeners to your house plants, I've done it. There's no need to be embarrassed. Like it's interesting, you know, as a society, we've grown like so far disconnected to nature. I like to say you don't know what you don't know. With plants, like we're not really taught that nature is full of living things, you know? So it's normal to kill plants. I still kill plants as a professional plant lady, right? Like I composted a fern two two weeks ago because it was no longer thriving in my house. So, you know, if you kill a plant, you're not a bad person and you're not a plant killer. I think people also, you know, and I'm guilty of this, you kill a plant or two and then you label yourself a plant killer and you don't allow yourself the joy of caring for plants, right? It's just about finding the right plant for yourself. So if you're a plant killer, if you've killed a plant, I think there's always a lesson to to learn in every plant fail. In my corner of the woods, we call it a plant fail is when you kill a plant. So, you know, how to stop killing your house plants. Let's, uh, let's take this through the lens of the, what I used to do to kill my plants. And then I'll explain what I was doing wrong and then how to fix it. Two main things that people do when they're accidentally killing their plants. The number one biggest thing that someone can do to set themselves up for success is to understand what light you're working with indoors. So most of us, we overestimate how much light our homes have. If you think about it, these plants are growing outdoors in tropical environments. Most of our house plants are tropical, tropical. So they're, you know, in 60 to 80% humidity. They're basking in the sun all day. Even if they're in the shade under a tree, the shade outdoors is like 10 times more strong than shade or highlight indoors. So understand that, you know, your plants already probably aren't getting enough light. And then you're probably underestimating the light in your home because of our light fixtures. An easy way to start assessing your indoor lighting environment is what direction your windows face. So the way that it works is the strongest window exposure for houseplants is Southern. That's basically because the sun, if you're in the Northern hemisphere, rises from East, sets in the West. If you have a Southern facing window, you're experiencing sunlight all day long. You're getting like six to eight hours of direct sunlight. Then second strongest is the West exposure because the sun gets stronger as it sets. Third strongest is Eastern exposure. It's a little bit gentler light in the morning. And then kind of the worst exposure, the lowest exposure for, for plants. If you have Northern facing windows, there's a limited amount of plants that you can choose that will thrive and you might want to supplement with grow lights. So that's like a good place to start. You can just take your phone out, open the compass, see where your windows are facing, and then look out of your windows because the other thing, the extra layer that might be confusing here is you could have a Southern facing window that has you know, I, I ideally bright exposure, but if there's a huge tree in front of your window, that window might be in shade and actually might be more of a Northern facing window. So you kind of have to become like a little super sleuth. If this, if what I've just said is too confusing and people have checked out, I have a free download on my website called understanding natural light. I'll give you the link. You can include it in the show notes, okay, yeah. but it's actually a three day worksheet. It's really easy. You download a free app and I kind of walk you through how to assess your indoor lighting environment. And then once you understand your indoor lighting environment, it's just about picking the plants that match your environment. So if you've got high light, you can, you know, do succulents, you can do Hoya, you can do pretty much anything with a high light windowsill. If you have more of a low light environment, there's plenty of options for you. You can do snake plants, you can do ZZ plants, you can do Monstera. So it's really just about 
figuring that out. And then I think another additional pain point for people and a reason why a lot of people kill plants is they don't pick plants for their lifestyle and personality. This was something that I've seen over and over and over and over again in my community. So I actually created a free test on my website because I was like, this is crazy. I've talked to like thousands of people now that fit into these different personality archetypes. So if you're someone who has little kids at home or you travel a lot, if you're like a consultant and you're always traveling for your job, you can't be watering your plants every day. Like if you brought home a fern, which is a plant that needs a lot of water and you don't have the time, that fern isn't going to do well. But if you have high light and you get a succulent, you know, or you get a high light you know, drought tolerant plant, that's going to be the perfect plant for your situation. So I think it's this one, two punch, this combination of figuring out your lighting and then figuring out your lifestyle and what plants fit that puzzle piece of what your light environment is and what your lifestyle is, and then figuring out a routine to care for them. So that was a really long answer, but I've seen a lot of plant fails in my time. So I try right. and you know, make umbrella answers to, to help as many people as possible. <laughs> yeah, no, that was actually really helpful. And you brought up some things that I think we forget to think about. Like you're just like, ah, I'll set it in this window and it's it's a window, but is it really getting the right amount of sunlight? I have a issue with keeping fiddle figs alive. So I've tried it and my sister, she gets them and then they just go crazy Yep. and mine always die. And so I'm, I'm sure that I'm doing something wrong with that. Well, fiddly figs actually. So I like to say there are a couple of plants that have like a lot of fake news going around about them. Succulents mm-hmm. being easy to care for. Like everyone thinks, I don't know why everyone thinks succulents are an easy plant to care for. They're like one of the hardest plants to keep alive. I've definitely indoors. killed succulents. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a big problem is people get a succulent and they're like, oh, I can't keep plants alive. I'm going to stick with succulents. Or you get a succulent as a favor for a party. If you don't give that succulent exactly what it needs, which is six to eight hours of bright, direct light and very infrequent watering, that plant is going to be toast in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a fake news plant. And then I think fiddly figs are really tricky. And this is why. Fiddly figs are in every single magazine you've ever seen. If you open any Better Home and Gardens, Anthropology, (laughs) but they're always styled in the corners of your house. Yeah. And right, fiddly, that's where mine, mine is, and I'm guessing that must be wrong. <laughs> so fiddly figs need bright, direct light. They're almost like a succulent. They love light. They grow in like Africa. They bathe in you know exposed like outdoor sun. So if you want your fiddly fig to thrive and become that tree that we you know that beautifully structured tree that we all see in all of these gorgeous photos of interior you know homes, you've got to put that plant in light. So either stick it in your window or you can do what I did because I love a tree in a corner. I love a corner filled with like a structural plant. I got a great grow light that looks like a modern pendant light. So they make like really fancy grow lights now. They look like normal, you know, sexy modern lighting. They make grow lights that are light bulbs. You could put in any other like lamps that you have. And I actually stuck my – yeah, so I stuck my fiddle leaf under that. The minute I did that, the leaves like tripled in size and I set it on a timer so the light turns on and off and I never have to think about it. And Figaro, that's my fiddly fig tree's name. Um, I don't have names for all my plants, but Figaro is one of them that does have one. Uh, He's thriving. And now we've moved again, but now he's in a Western facing window. So he's getting like, you know, four four hours of bright light a day. And I'm assuming they probably like warmth too, right? They do not. Yes. They do not like uh, ficus, the genus that that plant is. So the scientific name is ficus lyrata. Ficus don't like being moved a lot too. So like, don't put your fiddle leaf near a draft. (laughs) They don't like drafts. Oh, I have mine in like the all wrong spot right now. Yeah. (laughs) And it's totally normal. Why would you know? Why would you know that? Right? Like, of course that makes total sense. Like you don't know what you don't know. Right? Like, why would we know that? But yeah, they don't like drafts. They don't like changing space a lot. They don't like getting moved around. And so they'll drop those leaves. But they are vigorous. Like even if they drop their leaves, you can kind of give it a prune and then it'll it'll grow back for you. Okay. Um, but I would say, you know, stick that baby in as much sun as you can and it'll be much happier. Well, I like your idea of the lamp because I was thinking, okay, it's probably ideal in a windowsill, but I cannot put this size of thing on a windowsill. That's not going to work. So mm-hmm. if I put it really close to the window, it'll kind of be shaded by the wall. 
So probably the only option for me in that south facing window or like if I want a corner is to get a lamp. Now, what are the bulbs you recommend for that? Are you to search like grow light bulbs? Okay. Yes. I have become an expert in this. I'm in my 500 square foot apartment in New York City. I had southern facing windows, but I only had windows on one side of my apartment. So the majority of my apartment was low light except for my sunny windows. So I had... I think before we moved, I had six different grow lights. And I have a YouTube video with the tour of that. If, if oh, that would be helpful yeah. for your audience, I can give you the link. Yes. But um, I'll give you some some high-level things to look for. So with grow lights, there's so many of them on the market now. The number one thing that I recommend people looking for is a, a full-spectrum white light. So you don't want the grow lights that look purple or orange. You know, those look like you're growing cannabis, which is cool, but not not the look you're going for in a, you know, farmhouse lifestyle. No. <laughs> so, um, you know, you're going for more cozy vibes, more cozy, white, broad spectrum light vibes. That's what's going to replicate the sun the most. So number one, I'm always looking for a white light. If you're buying a lamp fixture, I have two companies that I recommend Soltech Solutions, they're like a long-term partner of mine. They make these really sexy, modern, pendant-style lights in white or black, so they blend in. I'm kind of bohemian with my style, so I actually macrame the cords, so it okay. looked really cool. It looked kind of like a cool macrame, kind of funky look, and they come with timers, so you just set them, you know, I usually set them 12 on, 12 off. They're energy efficient. The thing with the grow lights is you have to, depending on the plant, you need to just make sure that the plant is a certain amount of inches away from the bulb. So that's great. Soltech Solutions also makes a light, a bulb that you can put into any light fixture. So I had actually a desk lamp in my office that I just screwed the bulb into. Mm -hmm. There's another company, if you're looking for like smaller scale, but pretty looking grow lights, Modern Sprout is a great company. They make actually this light up here in my, my background is, um, their grow frames. So they make like frames that have grow lights in them. So you can put them on a gallery wall okay, and then have like living art. They also have like a bar that you could stick under your countertop. So there's like, there's all sorts of different grow lights that are available now. It's pretty incredible. And there's some really cool companies making them, but I definitely recommend go white, no matter what you're looking at, you know, white light, make sure that it has a timer because the thing with grow lights is that you, your plants need a certain amount of sun a day right. and you're not going to remember to turn those lights on and off. No. So put them on a timer and, you know, be mindful of the space between the light and the plant. But yeah, I have a, I have a ton of recommendations on my shop and my, a little tour, if that would be helpful for your audience. Cause it, it's a little intimidating. I think I also have a couple of episodes on my podcast that are just based on grow lights, like understanding the science of, of how the lights work and, and what you need to know about them. Cause it's, it's really fascinating how we've been able to replicate the sun yeah, that, <laughs> indoors. That is. If you're a nerd like me, I, yeah. And it never really occurred to me that, I mean, this is, seems pretty obvious now, but never really occurred to me that they could be in a regular lamp that actually looks nice. I'm just picturing like what you do whenever you start seeds in the spring before you put them outside. Like exactly. those kind of just, they're not, I'm always like, I can't wait till it's summer so I can get that stuff out of my house. You know, like it's not something yeah. I really enjoy looking at. Yeah. If you look at my YouTube tour from my apartment, the thing that I was the proudest of is I had you know, I think I had six grow lights in total and you would never know it. They just looked like normal lights. They looked right. like designed, like a designed aspect of my home. And I think that's where like the house plant world is moving towards as well. People want to bring nature indoors. People feel disconnected. There's so many reasons and studies that show that, you know, plants indoors can make you happier, increase creativity, decrease feelings of stress, you know, increase productivity for workers in office spaces, but no one wants to look like a seed starting farm, right? So yes, there have been some right. great companies that have kind of met that that need for sure for us girls who like a nice curated home aesthetic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's really good to know. I'm excited to look into that. I want to take a break from this episode to tell you about this month's sponsor, Tubes & Co. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast a while, you've definitely heard of Tubes & Co. I actually have recently sold my mom and my two sisters on Tubes & Co. makeup. We were on a girl's trip and we were sitting in the hotel room talking about our makeup and they were on their phones quickly ordering it. 
because I love it. I love it because it not only is natural and uses quality ingredients like grass-fed tallow and oils and things that you recognize and nothing that you don't and that's really bad for your skin and bad for your health. It can go into your skin, which is your body's largest organ, and actually affect your health whenever you're not using natural things. But not only that, it actually works. So I just had to update my foundation for my winter skin. I have to always get like a darker shade in the summer. And I also got the Tubes & Co mascara. I hadn't tried that yet. I have their bronzer, their highlighter. I have like their whole line of makeup now. I keep adding to it. I really love the primer that goes underneath the foundation. And of course the skincare, especially right now in the winter, my skin needs the extra hydration. And so I've been loving their tallow balm and their oil cleanser, the sea buckthorn oil cleanser. It also moisturizes and cleanses. I can't say enough good things about the company and their products. So they're made in America by a small company. I'm actually now friends with the owner as well. And just a genuinely awesome company that you can feel great about supporting and also the products are amazing. So head on over to tubesandco.com to check out their organic skincare, whether you're in need of moisturizers, cleansers, or their makeup, you can use the code farmhouse to get a discount over at tubesandco.com. Okay, the next bullet point on my house plant care 101 is growing plants on your windowsill. So we talked about that a little bit, but any more tips that you could give us? Yeah. So for your windowsill, especially as we're in the winter, be mindful of drafts. So mm -hmm. some people, I just released a big episode on winter plant care because there are a lot of things that happen to our homes in the winter that we don't necessarily like put two and two together of, oh, that could really mess up with my, my plants. Like if your windowsill is above a radiator mm -hmm. that kicks off a lot of heat and you have a bunch of plants either sitting on your radiator or sitting right above your windowsill, you're going to have to watch that to make sure that your plants don't get fried. Also, those radiators kick off a lot of dry air. Right. And our plants like to be between, you know, at least 40% humidity and most of our homes aren't. So that's something to be mindful of. The other thing with windowsills is they can be so drafty. Like my windowsills in my old home are so drafty and my plants... Yeah. You know, when I wake up in the morning, they're like frozen. <laughs> so mm -hmm. sometimes I actually pull my plants out of my windowsills in the winter or you can seal mm -hmm. them for the winter. So you can, you know, put some tape on, on them to seal them. But windowsills are a beautiful thing, right? That's where you're going to access the most of your light. So I would make sure, you know, unobstructed views of the sky is the ideal thing that we go for with a direct light. So your windowsills are where you're going to have your most direct light opportunities. So, you know, if you get six to eight hours of sunlight a, a day, you can try growing herbs on your windowsill. I have a whole episode on that if people are interested. Um, if not, this is where you can kind of play with your more higher light varieties. So, you know, plants that bloom. Good rule of thumb is if your plants have colors on their leaves, they likely need more light than just like a dark green plant. And the other thing with windowsills, if you have like pets or small children, make sure that those pots fit the windowsill. Yeah. So don't put an enormous pot on your windowsill. And I'm speaking from experience. I've knocked so many plants. <laughs> I've ruined so many planters from, you know, knocking stuff clumsily. I also try and like get little trays that I can put my plants on so I don't end up ruining you know, the windowsills paint or, or yeah. wood, whatever type of windowsill you have. Yeah. Windowsills are ideal because that's probably where your plants would get the most light in your home. Yeah. Do you have any ideas for like, if windowsills are small, like any creative ideas for how to still get them there and maybe just like building a new windowsill is the only option? I usually just keep my tiny plants in tiny pots on my windowsills. However, yeah. you, in order to make the most, get the most bang for your lighting buck, hanging from your curtain rods is great. Oh, So yeah. hanging planters. So your windowsill is limited real estate, right? But your window yes. is so many feet tall. So right. there are so many plant hangers. It's not just about the macrame plant hangers that were popular in the 70s. If you have a more modern aesthetic, like whatever right. aesthetic there is, like there's a hanger for you. Um, so you can, you know, create a curtain uh -huh. of hanging plants that yeah. are going to access that light. 
I've seen people build shelves Mm -hmm. kind of in their windows so that they have, you know, multiple, they kind of make more real estate. Yeah. You could push a table up against the windowsill, you know, Mm -hmm. one of those What's the name? You're probably more of an expert than I am. Like console table, like a real skinny. Exactly. Like the skinny little table. Mm -hmm. And then I also use plant stands. So my huge Western facing window in my living room, you know, I can only fit so many plants on it, but next to it, I have two armchairs. And then next to those armchairs, I have Ikea makes this fabulous plant stand. I've ordered so many of them, but it's a three-tiered plant stand. So you get three plants in one stand. It looks really pretty. It's wooden. And so I kind of increase my windowsill space with some plant stands to kind of lift the plants up to the window. Because the issue is when the window is small, if you put a plant below the window, that's like the lowest light in your home. Yes. So you just kind of- Got to prop them up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all really good ideas. I wasn't sure if you would have any. I'm like, oh, yeah, actually, I can think of all of those being a really good idea. (laughs) Yeah, good, good. Okay. The next one is how to propagate plants. Propagate free plants, right? Who doesn't want free plants? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Budget friendly. Budget friendly. Also a fabulous way to get your friends hooked on your houseplant love. <laughs> I mean, I love nothing more than cutting bouquets from it, from my garden and gifting them in the summer. But there's something very special about gifting a friend a cutting of one of your plants and letting that cutting grow in their house. You know, I have this great story I like to tell. A friend of mine had to move suddenly and she gifted me a jade plant that she had had that was like over 20 years old and it was huge. So I had to propagate it and made a bunch of smaller pots and I gifted my sister one of those cuttings. That plant grew so much in my sister's care that she then propagated it and gave it to two of her friends. So I think about like this plant's heart and spirit that is like kind of spread across the country now with all of us, you know, in, in different cities now. So I don't know, there's something really beautiful about that. So high level with plant propagation is you locate the node of the plant, which is where the tissue that allows the plant to grow roots. So it depends. So, okay, let's dial back for a minute. Um, plant propagation is very simple and easy, but you have to know the style of propagation for whatever plant you're working with. So we'll do a standard pothos philodendron plant for right now, which is probably the standard house plant that a lot of people have. Okay. But you can do, you know, stem tip cuttings, you can do node cuttings, you can do leaf bud cuttings. Like there's all sorts of different cuttings that you can take. And, you know, we can't cover that in a 40 minute episode, (laughs) but we can start with leaf tip cuttings. So if you have like a pothos, a philodendron, a monstera, a lot of tropical plants, this is this is what you'll use. This is the method that you could do. So you're going to locate the node, which I like to call is the knuckle of a plant. So if you're looking at a plant stem, okay. it's where the other leaves are growing out of. And it kind of looks like this kind of stripe in the plant. And it's like a little, it bulges a little bit. So that's where the plant can create roots. So what you'll do is if you're holding your, you know, your pothos, you'll separate the plant right under the node you want to cut like only a fourth of an inch to separate the plant. So you don't want to leave a lot of that stem tissue on either side. And then with that plant, you'll cut the bottom two leaves off. So where those nodes are, you're going to remove the leaves. Okay. And then that's where roots will grow. Stick that puppy in water. Roots will show up. When the roots are, you know, one or two inches, maybe two inches long, ideally if they've branched, if, you know, the one root has turned into two roots, pop it in soil, keep the soil a little more moist when you first plant it up because it's not used to being in soil. So you want to kind of help its transition, keep the soil wetter, and then kind of reduce the water as you go. And that plant will establish and you've got a completely new free plant. If you have a spider plant, it gets even easier. Spider plants are another popular house plant, but like they grow pups in their plant and you can literally like take a small pot and stick one of the pups next to the plant in the pot. The pup will root and then you can just separate it. If you have succulents, another thing that you can do is, you know, succulents are pretty simple. And I I detail this pretty thoroughly in my book, in the back of my book too, if people need like photos. With a succulent, if you have like an echeveria, which is like a very common succulent, it's the one that looks like a rosette, you can remove the leaves. Okay, yeah. You know which ones I'm talking about? Oh, yes, definitely. 
Yeah, or like a jade. All you have to do is remove a leaf, let the leaf tip scar, like brown, and then put the leaf on a little bed of soil. And the tip where there's browning, they'll grow a new little plant. And if you kind of water it enough, you could watch a YouTube video or two to like make sure you're doing it correctly. But that one leaf will grow an entirely new plant. And it's wild to watch. Like it is so fun, especially in the winter. Like these are really fun projects to do in the winter when you're like going a little crazy Mm -hmm. in January, February before you're starting seeds. You like need a little project. It's really fun to like watch life appear in front of you when you look out the window and everything is, you know, dormant or dead or covered in snow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's that's something too, like forcing bulbs. I guess that's way down in the outline, but let's just talk about that right now. I love force. I actually just bought an amaryllis yesterday at the grocery store. Forcing bulbs is so underrated. It's so much fun, especially in the winter, like getting that bloom, getting that rapid growth Mm -hmm. in front of your eyes when everything feels so still is so fun. And if you're a houseplant collector, a lot of your houseplant, like a lot of your plant collection is green, right? Green is great, but it's great to have some colored flowers. So and you can force bulbs throughout the season. So like it's it, we're recording this in the holidays. You know, amaryllis are at every grocery store. Paper whites are one of my favorite things to force. And they're very simple. You get the bulbs. Mm-hmm. You know, you can buy yes. them in like a pack. That's like a forced bulb pack. Or you could just get the bulbs. You put them on top of some marbles in like a glass jar. You get to watch the roots grow. You get to watch the stem grow. And then you've got this gorgeous plant. Or you can pop pot the bulbs. Like my, the amaryllis I bought yesterday is potted. This is also with forcing bulbs, like where I cheat a little bit. And to me, it's worth the $5.99 at the grocery store to kind of buy the amaryllis pre kind of set up and started so that I can just enjoy the, the growth of the, of the stem and the flowers. So, you know, don't feel like you have to go to the garden center and buy the bulbs and like do it all from scratch, but mm-hmm. it is fun. But what what are your favorite bulbs to grow? I do paper whites. Those are probably my mm-hmm. favorites. I haven't done a ton. I did hyacinth, I think a few years back. That was really pretty. Now, do you freeze yours first? I know some people will freeze them first. Yeah, this is where it gets a little complicated. So there are certain bulbs and you have to Google it, but there are certain bulbs that do need a period of of cold. Cause if you think about it, right. Daffodils go through the period of cold outdoors. Yes. And then when it warms, that's what triggers the plant to bloom. Uh-huh. That's why I think sometimes if you want to enjoy a bulb moment, buying them pre-started for you, cause you know, they're pre-treated at right. the grocery store, you know, the garden center is a little bit easier, but if not, yeah, sometimes they involve a period of cold mm-hmm. and then you take them out, you plant them and you make sure that they have that warmth. And then right. that's what will actually trigger the pl- the bulb to grow. Mm-hmm. And I wish I could say that, you know, I, I put the, myself through the rigor rigmarole of that, but, um, come the holiday season, I feel like I'm so stressed doing right. all the shopping yeah. and traveling that it's simpler to just get one at the garden center. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'll think about that maybe next month right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Whenever all the greenery comes down and my house feels bare, that's probably when we're going to think about that and some more, some more house plants too, for sure. Are you curious about how to earn an income online when it comes to social media, podcasting, blogging, YouTube, I know a lot of people are very interested in starting a little business from home, whether to earn a side income or maybe even for a full-time income, but are unsure of how that works and the path that it takes to get there. The first thing that I started for my business was my blog, and it is still my favorite way to earn an income with an online business. I love YouTube. I love podcasting, but the most passive income that I've built is with my blogging business. And so I love teaching others how to do the same. I get messages from people all the time who share with me their experience of starting a blog after going through some of my resources and what it has done for them and their family. I have created a five day challenge. It walks you through narrowing down your niche, crafting your brand and coming up with a content plan for your successful blogging business. Now this is a free five day challenge and it also comes with a workbook, a five day challenge workbook that has yearly goals, sheets, uh, weekly planners, ways to take notes as you learn 
all of the concepts that are in this five day blogging challenge, a great resource to get you started. If you're just curious about how this whole thing works, or you are ready to dive in and learn how to build a blog. Maybe you've started a blog and you want to take it to the next level. This five day challenge is perfect for you. You can join by going to bit.ly forward slash five day blog challenge. That's the number five and then day blog challenge. Join us for five days of crafting your brand and taking your blog to the next level. Again, bit.ly forward slash five day blog challenge. Do you recommend any fertilizers or supplements for your house plants, or do you find that's mostly unnecessary? I, I remember one time I bought my fiddle fig a supplement or like a, maybe it was a fertilizer. It didn't help. And I think because I was putting it in all the wrong spots. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I've heard <laughs> one of my best friends, like I love her so much. She, uh, not a plant lady, not, not a big plant lady. And she yeah. had this huge cactus in her apartment and she was like, I'm going to fertilize my cactus. And she bought chemical granule fertilizer and covered the soil. I mean, she torched this cactus. She like covered the soil in, you know, these fertilizer granules and then watered it and it just totally burned everything. So, you know, I'm an Espoma organic girl. I don't know if you know that company, but they're, you know, a family run company that make organic pet safe products. I lean away from chemicals because I don't know. I I just I prefer, you know, organic gardening and I prefer organic soil for my house plants. So yeah, I think fertilizing can get really complicated and fertilizing can seem really complicated. I personally didn't fertilize my plants for the first year and a half of having them because I just was scared that I was going to do it wrong and I didn't know where to start. And that's kind of why I like orga- a spoma, like they have a house plant fertilizer. It's liquid. Okay. It's pre-measured. I pre-measure it. I dunk it in my watering can and I water my plants with it. Rule of thumb is when your plants are growing, that's when you fertilize them. So, you know, in the winter, you know, some people say don't fertilize your house plants in the winter. If you have your house plants under a grow light or if your house plants are getting a ton of light, like, and they're growing, give your plants food. They don't know it's winter. Yeah. They don't know it's winter. Plants make their food through the light, right? Through photosynthesis. So they make their food through light. But fertilizer has a lot of macro and micronutrients that help the plant be really vital. So yeah, fertilize when your plant is growing. For me, liquid fertilizer is the easiest thing where I can just measure it and dump it into my watering can and like not think about it too much. So I'm pretty low maintenance when it comes to that. I'm like, what's yeah. the easiest and healthiest thing that I can do? And that's that's what's worked for me. Some people like doing granules where you actually put these granules in the soil. So every time you water, your plants essentially get a burst of fertilizer through, you know, the granules getting wet. Okay. That's cool. I, I actually use that in my outdoor garden because um, edible plants need so much nutrition. They need so much more fertilizer than house plants do. House plants aren't growing as fast as the plants outdoors in our garden, right? They're they're moving at a slower pace. So I would say, you know, generally like feed, you know, spring and summer and then in the winter if you have grow lights too. Okay. Now, are there any plants that you have that you're moving outside whenever the season is appropriate? Yeah, this is a great question. And it's something that I think a lot of people (laughs) get wrong. So I'd love to give some tips. So yes, you can move your plants outside. It's a great opportunity for your plants to experience some rapid growth, soak in the sun. It does require some prep and some pre-work and some post-work. So your fiddle leaf fig actually is a great example of something that would thrive outside in the light. So why not put it outside and let it kind of shoot up in the summer and then bring it inside for the winter? but realize that that's a pretty big transition that you're asking your plant to go through. It's pretty drastic, right? So when you're putting it outside in the spring, your plant is going to go through some shock because it's all of a sudden getting so much light. So a lot of people recommend, you know, don't pick like the sunniest day in the middle of the summer to like bring your plant outside. Mm -hmm. Put it outside for a few hours a day, start it in the shade, and then graduate it to wherever you want it to live for the summer. If you have the time and patience to do that. Right. And then kind of the same mode of thinking for when you bring it back inside. It's going to go from a lot of light to a little bit of light. Right. And the other big thing when bringing your plants back inside is 
there are so many more pests outdoors than indoors. So Mm -hmm. I've heard horror stories of people putting their plants outside for the summer, bringing them inside. Pests hitchhiked on those houseplants, came inside, infested an entire plant collection, and, you know, they lose an entire plant collection to to thrips or spider mites or, you know, whatever was going on outside. So, you know, this word I feel like is triggering now for people, but I was using it before 2020. So quarantine your plants before when you bring them in. And this is a good rule of thumb. If you buy a plant at the garden center, if you buy a plant at the grocery store, if you're bringing a plant inside, you don't know what invisible pests are hanging out in the soil or on that plant. So if you have the time and space, isolate them for two weeks. Don't put them right in the middle of your entire plant collection because God forbid, you know, there's a spider mite infestation on that plant. You don't want it to take out your whole plant collection. Give that plant a couple of weeks to adjust to your house. You can check for pests, you know, look for webbing, look for physical pests, look for those kind of things. Yeah. Maybe spray it down with some horticultural soap. Make sure that it's all good before you introduce it to your plant collection. Okay. Yeah. Do you do that? Do you put your plants outside in the summer? You know, I haven't actually. It's just something that popped into my head as you were talking. I'm like, well, why don't I ever put them outside in the summer? And I'm like, well, probably because I never think about it enough to do that whole process of introducing it to the outside. But I do like the idea. And I also regret like getting, I always get ferns every year and then I never bring them inside. But really, I should. I should bring them inside. Like you said, though, they are kind of high maintenance. Ferns are tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And they're so large. But are you getting like the big bushy Boston fern? Yeah. So there are ferns that are hardier and I would argue the Boston fern is one of the hardiest. So you probably could. Okay. You could try bringing it inside. Just do you have humidifiers in your house? I really don't, but I should because we do heat with wood and so it does get very dry. I have, I mean, I own them for whenever the kids get coughs, so I could definitely hook them up. Yeah. I would say like, There are tons of people in my community that run humidifiers at all hours of the day because they really want to create optimum an optimum environment for their plants. I understand that's not everybody's journey, Um, and you know humidifiers require refilling and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, but but I understand that. But um, ferns definitely like a little bit more humidity. But I'll say I had a I had a Boston fern in my apartment that I do feel like plants adapt. So I think if you transitioned Mm -hmm. it well inside, it might be something for you to play with next year just as an experiment because they can be really beautiful. Yeah. They're so beautiful outside. I love them. I buy them every single year and I realize that's very wasteful, but I just do. I put them in my planters outside and... Yeah. Do you put them in like hanging baskets or do you have them like... Where where do you put them? They're on the ground. They're just in... I've done hanging baskets too, actually, quite a bit of that, but um, mostly they're just in probably like five different planters throughout like my porch and my back patio area. That's beautiful. You could also maybe play with like, maybe you don't bring all of them in, but maybe you propagate like maybe, and with a fern, you wouldn't propagate, you would divide it. Maybe you bring like a smaller chunk of the plant in, nurse it throughout the winter and then put it back outside and then let it fill the pot again. Right. Yeah. But also like, Pick your battles. If you want the big, yeah. you know, fluffy <laughs> fern, f- like live your best life, you know, but just an idea. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is an idea. And I always think about this every year too with like, I get a big rosemary plant. I'm like, this needs to come inside. And then when it comes down to it, I don't, I don't end up doing it, but it is a nice idea in theory. And if you. I will say rosemary is really hard indoors. Rosemary likes to be outdoors. Okay. Yeah. So that I would well, say. Okay. That's good to yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't bother. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, I think I feel like most herbs are, and you had. I think I was going to ask you about that too. Some tips for growing herbs indoors. I have found that for me, it's always just been a good idea in theory because the amount of water that it requires and the light. But maybe you have some tips that makes it work out better than it's worked out for me. Yeah, when you say it was a good idea in theory, but not in practice, is is that what you mean? Well, I just mean for the amount of watering, I'm like, okay, I'll just buy herbs at the grocery store in the winter <laughs> or just yeah, not use yeah. them. Yeah. Okay, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. So Okay, good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> have you noticed that I have thoughts on everything? But as That's I'm good. Really talking, I mean, so you're the plant lady. You better have thoughts on this stuff. <laughs> I'm the plant lady. It's also, I'm sure you understand podcaster to podcaster. Like, it's always so weird, but also fun to be interviewed instead of the interviewee. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Herbs need six to eight hours of direct sunlight a day 
to thrive, to have the bushy basil that you want, right? To have the rosemary that you want. Yes. Very few people have that naturally indoors. If you do, Mm -hmm. go for it. Right. Four inch pots of basil, all of it on your windowsill, especially in the winter. However, there are so many easy ways to grow plant to grow herbs indoors if you want. It does require an investment. So you need a grow light of sorts. You can do So there, that right there, that's something I have not done. So you're already going into territory that makes this way more doable. Okay. So then let me tell you now this is an investment, but it's so fun. So, and I call it in my book, it's called my smoothie spaceship tower. So I got in 2021, I was living in the middle of the woods, like in the middle of the woods, like very dark home to a wood cabin. So it was dark. Yeah. I got this, it's called a lettuce grow. It's a five foot tall hydroponic planter. It takes up only like a square foot though. It's cause it's vertical. Okay. And it has a pump. And you buy the plugs of the herbs and it comes with grow lights and the grow lights are on a timer. So it's basically like if you've ever seen like an arrow garden, it's like a really Mm -hmm. tall, wild looking like spaceship arrow garden. And all winter, I grew every herb we needed. We did not need to buy a boxed herb. I grew all of the smoothies, the lettuce for my smoothie material and bok choy, like all of the super nutritious greens that like you wouldn't necessarily always find at the grocery store. I had so much fun. I grew tomatoes. I grew violas. I grew edible flowers. Oh, that does sound fun. It was so fun. And if you have kids too, I grew like violas. So I would harvest bok choy and spinach and then I would cook my husband. I called it a garden. So I would like saute greens, but then I would put the violas on top (laughs) and it was just really fun. And also, you know, my husband has seasonal affective disorder and I mean, he wouldn't say that he does, but I would say that he does. And um, Mm -hmm. the lights are so strong that he would like sit by the grow, you know, he would, we had it next to our couch and he would like bask in the sunlight. So that's definitely like like the most right there. Yeah. A little bit of summer. So that's definitely the most expensive option. I think I have a coupon code for them. If I do, I'll send it over to you. If not, you know, there are smaller scale options that you can do. So you can do the like $99, arrow garden option, you know, rise gardens is another company that has like smaller versions of, you know, you're putting the plug in, but you plug the thing in, it knows when to turn the lights on, when to not, you can put it on your kitchen counter. They're smaller. And, you know, if you're just someone who uses a lot of basil or a lot of rosemary or, you know, whatever, you can like choose, you know, three to six herbs that you can grow throughout the year. And personally, like, it's one of the funnest things that I own. Like we're yeah. obsessed with it. Actually, we haven't we haven't installed it in the house that we just moved into. And my husband and I were just like, are we gonna get the lettuce grow out of the basement? Like, are we gonna do it this year? Yeah. <laughs> and we just got our first snow and I'm already like itching for it. Yeah. That sounds really interesting. I'm thinking about in my house where I could put something like that. How does the water work with it? Yeah, so this it depends on like which product we're talking about. With the lettuce grow, you fill it in the bottom. So it's a lot of water in the bottom and you put the nutrients. So it's, uh, sorry to clarify. So this is hydroponic gardening. So you're basically putting nutrients in the water right. and the water is feeding the roots and the roots are uptaking the nutrients through that, okay. but yeah. they have it down to so a no side. soil. No soil. Yeah. So it's soil free. Gotcha. It's just okay. water. And you know, the smaller kits come with you know whatever little vial of something you put in the water. The lettuce grow comes with like a water neutralizer, like a pH, you have to like neutralize the pH that takes five minutes. And then you have to like add, I say it's like 10 minutes of maintenance a week to grow all that food. Cause you have to add water, maybe 15 minutes. You have to add water to the reservoir once, once a week. And then you have to add the nutrients and make sure that the the water is pH balanced, but they tell, they teach you how to do it. It's really easy. That sounds really, really interesting. So I know I'm not a salesperson, but (laughs) I yeah, just, no, I that love, sounds I like love them so much. Extra <laughs> They're not fun right me now. to say this to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, that's about the best thing about summer is every single meal, even if you really mess up on your garden, like you just didn't weed it right and everything's going wrong. I always am able to manage to get a really bountiful herb garden every year because they're easy. You know, they they grow really easy. It's so empowering. Yeah, it's just every single meal has something delicious about it. And so that that is something that makes summer so much brighter than winter. So 
Yeah, it's so empowering. It also tastes so much better. It's like once you have basil cut off your basil plant, it's like really hard to go back to the grocery store, like plastic boxed pre-cut basil, you know? Yeah. I just did a great interview on herbalism with this amazing woman who like taught me how to make my own tea and taught me how to, you know, dry your herbs too. So if you do have a really bountiful herb, you know, you can dry it all and then you can use it medicinally. And, you know, that's a whole another thing I'm very curious. I don't know much about herbalism, but I'm very interested in, in -hmm. learning more, but yeah, herbs are amazing. And also tomatoes are amazing. Tomatoes are my other thing. What does your garden look like? How big is your garden? It is, let's see here, probably like 10 raised beds. And some years we do more than other years. I'll say the last couple of years, we've definitely neglected it more and more, but we grow a lot of tomatoes and a lot of small kids, right? Yeah. We have seven kids and the youngest ones are, you know, they're all, I have three that are five and under. And so yeah, it just gets. Oh to my gosh, <laughs> you're not in a season of like doting on your plants for sure. No, <laughs> unless maybe when they're a little older, you can get them more involved in it. That's always but been the goal. Now, that and, totally but that sense. even takes a lot of intention mm-hmm. too. Like s- setting that all up, you know, unless they're naturally interested, there's there's always that too. So that's something we've struggled with with the garden. Is like, okay, I really want the kids to take this over, and even like the mental space to make that happen hasn't so far really worked out that well but we still do grow a ton of tomatoes i'm i'm with you on that tomatoes are just the best my, next year my daughter was actually like why don't we just only grow tomatoes next year tomatoes and herbs and i'm like you know what why don't we it's the only thing we really really want why don't from the you? garden is fresh homegrown tomatoes and maybe some lettuce right yeah some lettuce yeah yes. i feel like lettuce is the only other thing what's your favorite tomato to grow what what varietals oh, do you like? i i really like the big juicy ones like i I like, in theory, the little, like, cherry tomatoes and the grape tomatoes. Those are great, but they're just annoying to harvest. And Roma tomatoes are great, but they're just, they don't give you that juicy tomato. And so I don't even know what variety mm-hmm. I grow, but it's always just, like, the big juicy ones is what I what I prefer. Yeah, beefsteak. Yeah. That's so interesting because I'm a cherry. I only grow cherry tomatoes. Well, we <laughs> That's grow so funny. We, we have grow completely a ton opposite of them. tastes. Because they're so mm-hmm. good, but then they're really annoying to deal with. Like, if you're wanting to make... I guess they're good if you're wanting to make like a pizza sauce. I just throw them straight into the pot, add a little bit of, you know, onions, garlic, butter, Mm -hmm. and you can just blend them. So that's pretty nice. But just, I feel like they just take a while to like get a lot, you know? Totally. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Learning to grow them from seed too is like a whole different, once you grow plants from seed, that like empowerment also is just like, oh my God, I grew you from seed and now I'm eating you. Yeah. Those are more special. But tomatoes (laughs) are also definitely, I think like- much easier to buy at the garden center pre-started. Yes, they even though are. I like to, st- I yeah, I like to start them from seed. But yeah, I totally get that. That's not everybody's journey as well. <laughs> yeah, I've I've done both, and a lot of years I will do both. But then because I don't take the time to really like acclimate them to the outside, the ones I get from the garden center always are doing better by about June. So probably mm-hmm. should just start there instead of even yeah. trying for it. But I'll do it every year. I'll do it. I'll get my my seed starting stuff out. I'll put up the grow lights and I'll just, I'll do it whether it makes it or not. It's just like a January, February, probably more like March ritual. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Another thing with your kids that might be interesting. And once again, like take it or leave it. Right. Cause I don't have kids. So I feel like I always like preach. I love kids and I, you know, I've had a lot of episodes about plants and children, but, um, it could be interesting. Have you ever done like giving them one dedicated garden bed? Yeah, I've thought about that. We haven't specifically done it, but that's been like a, a something that we've thought about doing. Yes. Or we've talked about doing. Yeah. Some people I follow, they have their kids like have their own garden bed and it like teaches them, you know, when it's their own and they feel more like ownership over it. They feel more inclined, uh-huh. yeah. but I don't know. I can't speak to yeah. experience. I just follow influencers who do that. So. Right. Yes. I, I like the idea again, again with that you need to follow through on that. Like kids will take ownership of it, but also like they might not care enough. And so, and it's not that I am obviously against following through with things with kids because that is how you build disciplines and things, but there's just only so many things. And so a lot of times, like so far, the gardening thing hasn't taken enough into our 
priorities, I guess you could say, to follow through on, yeah, getting the kids to take ownership of it. That but makes that is, total sense. That is one of my very idealistic goals. And I'm like, this year, this year, we're going to all work on this together every single day. And so we'll see. Hopefully that goes really well because I see a lot of value in that. And I think that the kids would really enjoy it if they built up some confidence in learning how to do that for themselves. Yeah, totally. And also like there are seasons to everything, you know, like if it's not this season, you know, there'll, there'll be seasons in the future when that makes sense too. And also like incrementally, right? Like it doesn't, I don't know. I feel like I've seen this with myself as I like throw myself so hardcore all into the deep end of the pond. And maybe it's like Mm -hmm. going into the shallow end first and, you know, figuring it all out. Yeah. Maybe just they could just grow a little herb bed or little tomatoes or something. My son always wants to do a pumpkin patch. And I'm like, yeah, that's going to take over the whole garden. Right. So I don't think that's going to quite work out this oh year. Oh, my God. That sounds epic. So. That sounds like fun. But that sounds hard. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, Maria, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. And I know that we really only scratched the surface. So tell people where they can find you to learn more about growing plants. I know I'm inspired personally to get some more plants. I really am. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. This will make my house so much more cheerful this winter. So yeah, tell us where we can follow up with you. Yeah. Come hang out in my planty corner of the world as well. You can come find me at the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, Growing Joy with Maria on socials and on my URL. I'll make sure that we send you the links. We just went through a rebrand. We used to be Bloom and Grow Radio. Now we're Growing Joy with Maria. And yeah, I'm here to help you learn how to cultivate, you know, how to grow houseplants. We have so many gardening episodes too, aimed at beginner gardeners. So if you're interested in, you know, getting your first couple of gardens under your belt, you know, we have so much. My whole podcast is about growing plants. So if you scroll, you know, our 200 episodes, there's how to grow tomatoes, how to grow an herb garden. In, how right. to do raised beds, how to grow in ground, like whatever you need, I've got here to support you. And yeah, and my book is called Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness and Plants. It's a self-care book about plant care. So how to use plants to live a happier life. And uh, if you are a plant person or a gardener, and even if you're not, there's, there's a lot of really fun things in there. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. It was so nice to be here. Thank you. And I hope to have you on my show sometime soon. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. I will see you in the next one.